Good morning to you all. Inner peace. Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I have done, but because of who you are. That's the song that was just sung, and that's, uh, wow, wow. Beautiful uh, introduction to the thoughts that I will be sharing with you. So thank you, Shemaya, and thank the Lord for inspiring him to sing this song. Please join me as I begin with a word of prayer, and then we will get into it. <coughs> Lord, what a joy it is to come before your throne again and again and again, knowing that we are accepted, not because of who we are, Lord, not because of what we have done, but because of who you are and because of what you have done through your son, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Father, I surrender my heart, my mind, my lips to you now. I ask that you'll speak to me, you will speak through me, you will speak to your people, Lord, that the thoughts you have laid on my heart and the thoughts that I will share will be words of life to your people and will bring them closer to you. We love you, Father, and we give all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. <coughs> now, for those who came this morning for the first time, weren't here last night, um, before my sermon last night, I shared that I uh, have released an online Godhead course, an online Godhead course. You can find it on www.imadaudi.com. It's my name, I-M-A-D-A-W-D-E.com. It has 27 lessons and over 80 short videos of uh, answering objections. That's video lessons and written and so forth. Please uh, register for free and make use of it if you would like to. Now, the thoughts that I'll be sharing with you now I have entitled Inner Peace. <clears throat> Inner Peace. In 1981, the United Nations established the International Day of Peace, International Day of Peace, to be celebrated every year in September, this month, right? In, in, uh, prior to that, in 1967, Pope Paul VI established the World Day of Peace to be celebrated on January the 1st of every year. This year, the United Nations, in preparation for the celebration of the International Day of Peace, they said, never has our world needed peace more. You don't need to be a genius to realize that our world is in desperate need of peace. You don't need much knowledge, much education. You just need to look around you to know that our world is in desperate need of peace. But not only peace in the world, we as individuals are in desperate need of personal peace, of inner peace, right? <clears throat> you know, the two biggest causes of death in the world are heart disease and cancer, heart disease and cancer. And stress has, be, has been strongly linked with both heart disease and cancer. And the opposite of stress, the antidote to stress, is inner peace. Because when you have inner peace, regardless what the world throws at you, you will have peace through the trouble. You will not have chronic stress like most of humanity has. <clears throat> chronic stress, right? But because most people do not have inner peace, when they face problems, the problems bring about stress. The stress becomes chronic stress, and that causes problems in their health, gives them psychological problems, and most importantly, it gives them spiritual problems. It causes problems in our spiritual journey as we're walking this journey with Jesus on our way to heaven. Stress, so many times, chokes spirituality out of people. That's why God says, through Paul and Philippians, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, not the solution to your problem, 
Not the money that you're lacking, not the partner that you're praying for, not the healing that you're asking for, but the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God knows that our greatest need is peace. You see, if God is to only give us solutions, he'll give me solution to the problem I'm crying about, and guess what will happen tomorrow? I'll face another problem. And he gives me a solution to that problem, guess what will happen the day after that? If you have lived only a few years in this world, you realize that life on this world is one big problem that is made up of many small problems. So God rec realizes and God knows that our greatest need in this life is not solution to the problems, but peace to keep us safe, to keep us close to him, to keep our heart and our mind from collapsing through our problems as we go through problems. You know, one, one Christian philosopher once said that life is a procession towards your funeral. And if you think about it, it's true. From the day you are born, you are marching to your funeral. Unless Jesus comes back, right? So life is one big problem made up of many small problems. And that's why God says, look, what you most desperately need is peace, is my peace. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world giveth do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You know, the world is obsessed with chasing happiness and success. These are the two most chased things in this world, happiness and success. But you know what? When you attain to happiness, you, you come to the realization that it's nothing but a fleeting emotion that goes away straight after you attain it. And when you get to success, when you become successful, you realize that success is easily taken away from you. It comes today, it's gone tomorrow. Inner peace, on the other hand, is different. True inner peace is permanent. It is an internal peace and rest which is not controlled by external circumstances. Come what may on the outside. Life can throw anything it wants at you. If you have inner peace, it doesn't matter because you will go through it and you will come out on the other end undamaged. You will come out the other end stronger because you had peace through your trouble, right? So what are you chasing? A permanent solution or a temporary fix? The pursuit of peace is the most important pursuit you will have in your life. And the most aspect of peace is our peace with God. Because our peace with God surpasses this world. It goes to eternity. It carries through to what is after this life. And in order to have this peace, this true peace, we need to understand what the foundation of this peace with God is. Right? Now, I'm not simply talking about a feeling or an emotion. I'm talking about this inner, genuine peace that we have with God that leads us to come before the throne boldly, that leads us to go through whatever troubles life throws our way boldly with our head up. That's the peace that I'm talking about. That's the peace that we most desperately need. And practically speaking, what is this peace based upon? Do you know what this peace is based upon? Your peace with God? Here it is. Let Paul tell you. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Because we are justified by faith, because we are justified by faith, we have peace with God. Do you know now why most of the world, most Christians do not have peace with God? Because they have not come to the true understanding of justification by faith. 
That's why they don't have peace with God. And if you don't have peace with God, you might as well forget about having peace altogether because that is the most important and the most crucial peace you can have in your life. Peace with God. Now, <coughs> you will tell me, someone thinking, well, brother, that's, I mean, that's a good verse, but we know it, man. Like, what are you, what are you telling us? I know you know it. But at the same time, I know that most people don't know the context of that verse, don't understand the context of the verse. They might have read the context of that verse, but they don't understand the context of that verse. That's why they have not come to the true understanding of justification by faith. And my aim today is to explain to you the context. It's so simple, yet so profound and so beautiful. Right? Now remember, Paul says, therefore. That's a concluding statement. That's not his argument, that's the conclusion of his argument. For us to understand the conclusion, we need to understand the argument, right? Now, about this conclusion, about this justification by faith, notice what Martin Luther says. I, I don't have the reference here, I can get it to you. Come and ask me later. Uh, I can get it for you. He says, justification by faith is the head and the cornerstone. It alone begets, nourishes, builds, preserves and defends the church of God. And without it, the church of God cannot exist for one hour. For no one who does not hold this article, or to use Paul's expression, this sound doctrine, is able to teach a right in the church or successfully to resist any adversary. This is the heel of the seed that opposes the old serpent and crushes its head. That is why Satan, in turn, cannot but persecute it. Amen. Justification by faith. Talking about the same doctrine, justification by faith, Ellen White says, if through the grace of Christ his people will become new bottles, he will fill them with the new wine. God will give additional light and all truth will be recovered and replaced in the framework of truth. And wherever the laborers go, they will triumph. As Christ's ambassadors, they are to search the scriptures to seek for the truth that have been hidden beneath the rubbish of error. And every ray of light received is to be communicated to others. One, one, interest will prevail. One, one subject will swallow up every other. Christ, our righteousness. About the same truth, justification by, uh, by faith, Paul says... Because we are justified by faith, we have peace with God. You cannot get any more important teaching in the New Testament than justification by faith. It is the meaning of the cross. It is the outcome of the cross. Are you with me? Justification by faith is, is the new covenant. Right? Right? It is the most important teaching. So, let's look at Paul's argument that led him to the conclusion that he says, therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God. I want us to look at the argument. I want to pull some lessons out of it. Very simple. Hopefully, it will be a short message, but hopefully, it will be a compound and meaningful message. In chapter 1 of Romans, Paul proves that all the Gentiles are sinners. In chapter 2, he proves that all the Jews are sinners. In chapter 3, he concludes, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Jew or Gentile, I don't care where you come from. There is none righteous, no, not one. None. Don't care how holy you think you are. Don't care how many laws you have obeyed. I don't care what you've done. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. He's building an argument. Right? He took two chapters to prove that everybody, Jew and Gentile, they sinners. They are in need of a Savior. He concludes there is none righteous, no, not one. And then he says in the same chapter, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. I don't care how many laws you obey. You have broken one, at least one, since you're born. Haven't you? That makes you a sinner worthy of death. Doesn't matter what you do after that. You're gone, man. You're gone. Your life is gone. Forget it. Right? But then he says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. 
even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Last night, I highlighted the importance of the word believe, especially that it is written by the apostle Paul, who was a legalist. Remember, I gave the example. When you stand up today and you say Jesus is the Son of God, it means something different when the then when a Trinitarian stands up and he says Jesus is the Son of God, you mean something by it. Why? Because you've been in ignorance, you have come to the light, you have understood the value and the importance and the truth of the Sonship of Christ. So when you say it, you mean something by it. When this man who was a legalist, who lived by the law, who was as far as the righteousness of the law is concerned, he was blameless. That's what he thought. And now he came to understand the righteousness by faith. And he says, it is unto all and upon all of them that believe. He means something by it. It's not by works, man. I've been there. I've walked that road. I could not get there. Now I've come to believe that it is to him that believes, right? So we, we, we've covered all that last night. Then he concludes at the end of chapter 3. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith, without the deeds of the law. Don't care what law you think it is. Don't care how many of those laws you've obeyed. Don't care how good you are when it comes to those laws. That's the conclusion. Can't escape it. Can't squeeze out of it. Right? All right. Whatever justification by faith is, it has to harmonize with this verse. It's without the deeds of the law. Now, Paul is no dummy. Paul is a master writer, argument, argument presenter, plus he's inspired by the Spirit. He knows that his readers are a mixed multitude. In Rome, you have Gentiles, you have Jews. He knows that his readers are a mixed multitude. You have genuine believers, you have troublemakers, Judaizers. So he wants to present to them an argument to prove his point. After he comes to this conclusion, he's thinking, okay, know that they are going to object. So how can I prove to my readers, Jews and Gentiles, believers and Judaizers, that what I'm saying is correct? So in the very next chapter, in chapter 4, he appeals to Abraham. The example of Abraham. We're going to examine it, right? Why Abraham? Why is he appealing to Abraham? Few reasons I can think of. One, Abraham is the father of the faithful. The Jews prided themselves of being, we are the seed of Abraham, right? Okay, that's one. Two, Abraham was an uncircumcised Gentile. Abraham was not a Jew. Abraham was a Gentile. God called him when he was a Gentile. Circumcision came to him as a seal of the righteousness he already received while he was a Gentile. Right? Okay, well, that makes sense now. His audience are Jews and Gentiles. He's referring to a person who is the father of all the faithful, father of all the Jews, but he's a Gentile as well. And another reason Abraham lived and was counted righteous prior to the old covenant. When you're talking to a Judaizer, the best thing to argue is to present to that person a righteousness that existed outside the old covenant. Abraham existed outside the Old Covenant, before the Old Covenant, before Mount Sinai. And he was counted righteous before the Old Covenant came. So he's talking to Judaizers, and he's showing them a righteousness outside the Old Covenant. So just get your head out of the sand, man. Just look outside the Old Covenant a bit, and you will see a righteousness that I'm presenting to you, right? <clears throat> That's why Abraham. So he begins in Romans chapter 4 and verse 1 by saying, what shall we say then? That Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he has wherefore to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. Okay, pause for a second. The first question, what is Paul's aim? What is Paul trying to prove by pointing to Abraham. He's trying to prove that Abraham was not justified by works. That justification is by faith alone without works, right? That's his aim. That's what he led in the first three chapters. That's what he's telling us about Abraham. Abraham had no works to glory before God. He believed and it was counted to him for righteousness. Okay, we know that. Number two, 
where was Paul quoting from? Abraham believed God was counted to him for righteousness. You know what? Most readers, when we read about Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness, we think Abraham believed God. God called him out of his home, out of his country, and Abraham left by faith, right? Or we think God asked Abraham to offer up his son, and Abraham believed and obeyed, and he offered up his son, and God counted him for righteousness, right? Wrong. Wrong. That's not where Paul is quoting from. Paul is quoting from Genesis 15. Let me read it for you. And Abraham said, this is, by the way, after Abraham left home, after Abraham gave his wife to Pharaoh to be Pharaoh's wife, because he was so brave, he wanted to save his own life, so he gave his wife, right? Bravery. <clears throat> Faithfulness. Perfect example of faithfulness, right? He gives his wife to another man. What a coward. What a coward. So, Genesis 15, now, after all that, says, And Abraham said, that's God appeared to him. He's talking to him. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one is born in my house, is my heir, about Eliezer, the servant. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine bowels, thine own bowels, shall be thine heir. Right? Abraham came presenting a human solution to God. Look, man. I'm getting old. Sarah's getting old. I'm not going to have a child. Why don't I help you out in here? Take my servant. Make him there. God says, no. He's going to be born of thee. Keeps on going. And he brought him forth. Now, God calls Abraham outside the tent. He brought him forth abroad, outside the tent, and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And the next verse... And he believed in the Lord, and he, that's the Lord, counted it to him for righteousness. This is the first time, and guess what? The only time that God ever said those words to Abraham. The only time. Never again. The only reference, the only quote of these words to Abraham in the Old Testament is this. After presenting a human solution to God and then believing that God is able to give him a son, God counted him for righteousness. Now, I was wondering why. Like, come on, Lord. I mean, why? Why now? Why this example? I mean, if, 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 if you said those words to Abraham when he left home, I mean, the guy did a major act of faith. He just packed up and left. His neighbors would have thought the guy is crazy. Or, or, or if you said those words when actually Abraham had Isaac some, some 15 to 25 years later, I understand he had Isaac. Or when, when Abraham offered up his son Isaac, I understand that's a major act of faith. I understand that. Why now? Why here? And when I understood why now and why here, I understood Paul's argument in Romans 4. And I understood what it means to be justified by faith. You see, when Abraham left home, he, had an out he, dem he outwardly demonstrated faith. Right? God said, leave. Abraham obeyed. Abraham left. That's an outward manifestation of inward faith, right? That's beautiful. When Abraham offered up his son, Abraham outwardly demonstrated an inner faith, did he not? That's a beautiful outward manifestation of faith. He believed, he trusted. And had God said at either of those times, Abraham believed and obeyed, and God counted him for righteousness, then Abraham would have something to glory. Abraham would say, I've obeyed, you owe me. It would have been a business deal. But God does not want a business deal. God is not interested in business with humanity because he knows we're crooks. He knows we fail. 
He knows our promises are like ropes of sand. So he said, look, man, I'm not going to do any business with you. I'm just going to give you a gift. How about that? Can you handle that? Can you not mess up a gift, man? And we still mess it up. That's how messed up we are. We still mess up a free gift. Right? Look, when you understand this, <coughs> God called Abraham outside the tent. He gave him a promise. Abraham believed God's promise. And while Abraham is standing outside the tent, he didn't go in the tent and sleep with Sarah yet. While he's standing outside the tent, God counted it to him for righteousness. What does this tell you and me? It says that when God saw faith, in spite of the absence of the outward manifestation of faith from Abraham's side, plus in spite of the outward manifestation of God's miraculous power, Sarah was not pregnant, didn't get pregnant for another 25 years, Faith in spite of the absence of outward work from God's side and from man's side. Pure faith in the heart in spite of the absence of work was so pleasing to God that God counted to him for righteousness. Do you understand why here? Do you understand why now? Because this example could not entail works. And God says, perfect, perfect. If I declare Abraham, if I counted for righteousness for Abraham now, then he and all those who read it later cannot find any work to weave into the salvation I'm giving them. We are selfish creatures by nature, and we want to find a way to get credit for it. We're desperate to find a way to get credit for the salvation God, God is offering us. So he picks an example where there's no miraculous power on God's side, no outward manifestation of faith on Abraham's side. And it says, this is the perfect example. I see faith in the heart of Abraham. In spite of the absence of outward manifestation, that's enough for me to count him righteous. Do you understand why here? Nowhere else in the Old Testament, God says, Abraham believed and counted to him for righteousness. Nowhere else. That's the only place. And that's where Paul is counting, uh, quoting from. <coughs> so don't miss the point that I'm saying. Faith in spite, in spite of the lack of outward manifestation of that faith. That's the key. Inward faith was enough for God to count it for righteousness to Abraham. That is Paul's point. That's why he's quoting from here. Faith in spite of of the weakness you still face. Faith in spite of the temptations you still battle with. Faith in spite of the mistakes you still do. Faith in spite of the unanswered questions and prayers that you have. Faith in spite of God's silence. Faith in spite of any outward manifestation is so pleasing to God that he counted it to Abraham for righteousness. Do you get the point? It was not when Abraham obeyed and left home. It was not when Abraham obeyed and offered up his son. It was not when Abraham did any outward work. It was when Abraham simply believed with all his heart, put his trust in God. God says, that's all I require from you, son. I count it to you for righteousness. Now, with this in mind, with this in mind, I want to read to you the very following words in Romans. We just read Romans chapter 4, verse 1, 2, 3. Notice the very following words, verse 4 and 5. Notice what Paul says. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of faith. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Do you understand those words now? Do you understand why Paul says to him that worketh not? Because he just quoted an example from Abraham when Abraham worked not, but just believed. 
And he's telling his readers, the Jews and the Gentiles, the believers and the Judaizers, the, 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 the deceivers, he's telling them, look, man, outside the old covenant, there is a righteousness that is presented, that is given to Abraham when he did not work, when he had no work whatsoever. To him that does not work, but believes. His faith is counted for righteousness. <coughs> Again, it was not when Abraham worked. It was not when Abraham demonstrated his faith by leaving home. It was not when Abraham demonstrated his faith by offering up his son. No, it was when Abraham had a lack of demonstration of faith when he was still outside the tent. It was at the time when God did not act and did not perform a miracle and did not get Sarah pregnant. It was during that time of lack of demonstration from God's part and Abraham's part. There was pure faith and nothing else. God said, that's the time. That's my moment. And I hope my people will see it and will understand it. <coughs> Are you following me? Amen. To him that worketh not but believeth. That's Abraham's example. It is belief without works. It was belief in the midst of faithlessness. Get the word right. I didn't say faithfulness. It was belief in the midst of faithlessness. In Genesis chapter 12, Abraham gave Sarah to Pharaoh. What a great guy. Father of the faithful, right? <laughs> chapter 12. In chapter 15, God appears to Abraham and he counts his faith for righteousness. Chapter 15. The very next chapter, chapter 16, Abraham marries Hagar and have Ishmael. What a faithful guy. <coughs> In the midst <coughs> of those acts of faithlessness, God sees an inner faith in this man's heart and he says, that's enough. I will count it to Abraham for righteousness. Right? That's why the very next verse, verse 5 of Romans 4, he says, But to him that worketh not, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies who? Was Abraham godly in giving his wife to another man? Was Abraham godly in marrying another woman, Hagar, and having a child? No. To him that justifies the ungodly. Who is he talking about? That man of faith at the end of that chapter that is called, he wavered not. We're getting to those verses. He wavered not, right? He did waver. He was worse than you and me. Uh, look, man, I've messed up so many times. I lost count, but I never gave my wife to another man, and I will never give my wife to another man to save my life. I will lay down my life right here, right now, to save any member in my family. I can say at least in that, I was better than this guy. <laughs> he was better than me in many other aspects. But in this, <laughs> Lord, come on. Right? God justifies the ungodly, the faithless. Why? Because they have an inner faith and belief and trust and remain connected to the vine. Regardless what life throws their way. Regardless how weak they are, regardless how faulty they are, regardless how many mistakes they do, they remain connected to the vine because they have come to realize, Lord, where else will we go? You have the words of life. Amen. <clears throat> are you with me? The key is faith in the absence of, in the absence of, in the absence of outward manifestation of that faith. That's the key. Don't miss it. All right, so many times we allow, we allow life's circumstances to impact our way, our faith. We think that because God is silent, I must not be accepted with God. We think that because God is not demonstrating his miraculous power in helping me and healing me and doing this and that, I must not be accepted with God. We think that because I'm not perfect, that I'm still doing mistakes, I'm still falling short, I'm still doing whatever it is, I must not be accepted with God. We think that because I, 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 I still manifest weakness and, and sometimes faithlessness and lack of faith, I must not be accepted with God. What I tell you is look at the father of the faithful. 
Look at him. Examine his record. If he can be accepted, if he can be counted righteous because he believed, I tell you, man, with the authority of the word of God, you are accepted and you are counted righteous if you remain connected to the vine. Amen? All along, all what God was asking is trust in him. Put your faith in me, son. Put your trust in me, daughter. That's all what I'm asking you to do. I know you cannot do it. I know you cannot perform. I know you cannot stay right. I know you're messed up and you're going to mess up. I'm just asking you to trust me. Now, after referring to Abraham's example, Paul applies his point to our lives. But first, he gives Abraham's record. Now, notice Abraham's record. When God gives Abraham's record in the New Testament, notice what he says about him in verse 18 of the same chapter. <coughs> Who? That's Abraham. Against hope, believed in hope. And that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now, this is talking about the outward manifestation of Abraham's faith. 25 years earlier, he believed that God counted to him for righteousness. 25 years earlier, Abraham was counted for, uh, righteous for his belief. 25 years later, Abraham has a son, right? When did this take place? When Abraham was 100. This is about 20 years after Abraham was counted righteous. Now, it's important. Why? Genesis 15, God gave him the promise. Abraham believed. God counted to him for righteousness. Genesis 15. Genesis 21, Abraham has Isaac. 20 years in between. Let me tell you what Abraham did in these 20 years when he was counted righteous. First, he marries Hagar and has Ishmael. That's when he was about 86 years old. Then Abraham laughed at God's promise to have Isaac. He was about 99 years old. God promised Abraham that within one year, get this, God appears to Abraham and tells him, listen, man, next year, this time, one year, just give me one more year, you're going to have a son, right? He was 99 years old. At that time, Sarah laughed at God's promise. Abraham Few weeks later, man, imagine God appearing to you and talking to you, says you, in one year. Few weeks later, few weeks later, Abraham gives his wife to Abimelech to save his own skin. Few months, few weeks, whatever it is you want to call it. Because a year later, after the promise, Sarah was with her husband and she had Isaac. He wavered not at the promise through unbelief. What? Are we talking about the same man? Within a few months of God appearing to him and telling him, look, man, in one year you're going to have a son. That's it. We have reached the deadline. One year you're going to have a son. Yeah, no problem, Lord, no problem. Abimelech, would you like this woman? Just don't kill me. What a man of faith. Right? This is definitely not a record of faithfulness. It's not. I mean, look, man, if you think I'm wrong, tell me. Is this a record of faithfulness? Yet in spite of the absence of outward manifestation of faithfulness, God still saw faith and trust in the heart of Abraham. And he still counted him righteous. And he still fulfilled his promise. And he still gave him a son. And he still made him the father of the faithful. The father of the faithful. Going on in Romans 4, verse 20 and 21, 22, he says, He, Abraham, staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Wow. But was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he, God, was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Few months before he had Isaac, before Isaac was born, he gave his wife to Abimelech. Few months. Yet when God recited the record of Abraham, he says, 
He wavered not at the promise. He was strong in faith. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you see potential in me. Because I sure definitely don't say it. Thank you that you count me and treat me based on your mercy and grace, not based on my works and what I deserve. Thank you, Lord. Because that's what I see here. I surely don't see a man of faith. Yet God saw faith in the heart of Abraham, in the midst of faith, faithlessness, in the midst of a lack of evidence of outward manifestation of faith. God saw an inward faith in the heart of Abraham, and he says, that is enough. I can perform, and I will get this man to the place where I want him to be. I can do it. He cannot. I can do it. <clears throat> Don't miss the point. Oops. Abraham's faith being fully persuaded that what God had promised, who was able to perform it? God. Don't miss this very important element of faith. God never asked me to believe that I'm able to perform what he promised me. He never asked me to believe that. He knows I can't. You'll be naive if you think you can't perform what God promised you. You can't. All what God has asked you, hey, listen, man, I promise to save you. I just want you to believe that I can save you. C can you just believe that? Can you just trust that? I'm not asking you to trust that you can save yourself. I'm not asking you to trust that you can forgive yourself. I'm not asking you to trust that you can have the victory over this weakness. I'm not asking you to believe any of that. I know you can't. I'm just asking you to believe that I can finish the work that I started in you. Can you believe that? Can you give me a break and let me work? That's all what God is asking. That's all what Abraham could offer to God. And God counted it to him for righteousness, right? Now, where am I here? <coughs> Belief was sandwiched in acts of faithlessness. Faithlessness before and after, yet there was belief in the heart of Abraham, and that was enough to God. Simple and pure faith, not complicated. Just believe that God is able to do what God promised to do. Simple. That's all what God is asking, right? He goes on to say, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for me also. For you also, for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we obey. If we do acts of faith, if we overcome. Is that what it says? To whom it shall be imputed if we believe. Just like Abraham. Lord, are you saying... That if I believe, if I put my trust in you, even though I'm weak, even though I'm still failing, even though I still mess up sometimes, even though I demonstrate faithfulness like Abraham did, you still can save me? Yes, that's what I'm saying, man. Like, can't you get it? Look at his example. Are you getting the point of the chapter? We sit and argue over Romans 5 and the verses there, but the basis of Romans 5, the foundation of Romans 5 is Romans 4. Justification by faith, the foundation of it is found in Romans 4. It is the same for you and me if we do what Abraham did. If we believe that God is able to fulfill his promise that he made to us. If we believe that what God has begun in me, God is able to perform. If we accept the word of God as our reality, in spite, in spite of the absence of the outward manifestation of that reality, if you just accept that what God says about you is the reality, even though you don't see that in your life, if we walk by faith in what God says about me, rather than by sight, and feelings. If we allow God's word to determine our identity and our destination and destiny, if we just believe, God will count it to you for righteousness. When we get to this place where God's 
word alone is the foundation and reality. God's word alone is your foundation and reality. In spite of the absence of the outward manifestation of that reality. That's the key. That's the key of Romans chapter 4. That's the key of the example that Paul quoted. That's the key of Abraham's life. If you believe, in spite of the absence of the outward manifestation, God will count it to you for righteousness. I didn't say it. That's the example. That's what the Word of God says. With all this in mind, when you understand this, then, and only then, can you read and understand Paul's conclusion. The very next verses, he says, Therefore, being justified by faith, and I would add the word alone, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Lord, are you telling me that even though I mess up, you still love me and I'm still accepted with you? Yes, son. Lord, are you telling me that even though sometimes I have lack of faith and I manifest faithlessness, you still love me and I'm still your son and I'm still accepted with you? Yes, son. That is the foundation of our peace. That is the foundation of our relationship with God. Faith in spite of the absence of the outward demonstration. I keep repeating it. I know I want to drill it in you. I want you to understand it. Faith in spite of the absence of outward manifestation. Faith in spite of the storms and difficulties of life. Faith in spite of the silence of God. Because we are justified by faith, not by works, we have peace with God. That's the key. The reason so many Christians are lacking that peace is because they don't understand this point. They think their peace with God is based upon them being justified by faith, which is based upon them doing acts of faith and proving that faith. And this kind of reasoning leads you to always examine your works, your faithfulness, your ability, your performance. And so long your eyes are on your performance, you will never, ever experience God's peace. You will never, ever have this inner peace. Because if you're honest, like I am, you will know that you're falling short, like I am. That's why Paul says, therefore, because, because you have come to understand that you're justified by faith in spite of the absence of your works, when you come to that realization, you can have peace with God. Are you following me? The base of inner peace is inner rest in God. And the basis of our inner rest with God is the true understanding that we are justified by faith without works. God justifies those who believe in spite, in spite of their lack of manifestation of that faith. Am I promoting sin? Absolutely not. Am I telling you, okay, well then go ahead, you know, you gave your life to God, do whatever you want to do? Absolutely not. You're missing my point. What I'm telling you is, God is greater than you and me. God's love is greater than my weakness and my sin. God's love is greater than my rebellion. What I'm telling you is, God is gracious. God is merciful. God is loving. His grace extends to all sinners. What I'm telling you is, when you come to understand that, and through your experience and my experience, when I come to realize how far I went in sin and God's grace still reached me, when I understand how deep you went in sin and God still reached you, I can understand how broad and wide and great and high and low God's love is. That's what the Bible says. How can you understand how wide and broad and, and deep and high God's love is if you don't understand how far and deep and, and wide and, and far from him in sin did you go? And his love and grace and mercy still reached you. My weakness demonstrates his strength, his love, his mercy, his grace, his patience. My weakness. If we're all born saints... And we lived all our life as saints, never done one mistake. Who can prove the grace of God? Where is it? Where is it? I'm not promoting sin. I'm promoting the grace of God, the love of God. And the thing is, when God's love and grace touches your heart, it will change your life. You will seek those things that please Him because you love Him. 
Not because you're scared of him, not because you want eternal life, not because you want the crown of life, but because how in the world can I disappoint somebody that loved me so much, that given so much to me, that has done so much to me? How can I disappoint him? And if love gets your heart, trust me, love is stronger than the, all the fire of hell. You don't believe me? Ask someone in love. And he will tell you. She will tell you. When you see the man of your dream, the woman of your dream, man, you're like a raging bull. You don't see in front of you. You give up anything and everything. Why? Love. Imagine the pure holy love of God. When that, when the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. Imagine when that is done. God didn't say when the obedience of God is shed abroad in your heart, when the law of God is shed abroad in your heart. No, he said, when the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. Love is what's, what captures us. Love, right? And when you understand, when you come to understand the love of God, then you will have this inner peace. Notice what John says. I'm reading it from the easy-to-read version because it brings the meaning out. <coughs> First John chapter 4, verse 16. 17 and 18, he says, So we know the love that God has for us, and we trust that love. God is love. Everyone who lives in love lives in God, and God lives in him. If God's love is made perfect in us, we can be, the, be without fear on the day when God judges the world. Only if the love of God is perfected in you can you be without fear, right? Right? We will be without fear because in this world we are like Jesus. Notice what he says next. Where God's love is, there is no fear. Because God's perfect love takes away fear. It is his punishment that makes a person fear. So his love is not, is not made perfect in the one who has Fear. If you're fearing God on the day of judgment, you have not come to understand his love. That's what John is saying. Because if love is perfected in you, you will not fear. Because love casts out fear. And it's not talking about you fearing a dog or fearing... No, no, it's talking about you fear versus no fear in the day of judgment. Meaning, you having fear or no fear as far as your salvation, your acceptance with God is concerned. And John is telling you, so long you have fear regarding your salvation, so long you have fear regarding your acceptance with God, you have not come to understand the love of God. That's what John is saying, not me. What? If you understand his love, man, he'll have you at hello if you just understand the love of God, right? Why would John say that? Because when we understand the love of God, when we understand the grace and the mercy of God, when we understand that God justifies the ungodly, when we understand that God justifies me by faith in spite of the lack of manifestation of that faith, when we understand that, we have peace. We no longer have fear. We have assurance. We have confidence in my Father. My Father loves me. My Father adopted me. My Father gave me a crown of life. My Father opened the gates of paradise wide open for me. My Father has a mansion for me in heaven. My Father has a new name for me. You know why? Because my Father is gracious. My Father is merciful. My Father is loving. And because I've committed my life to Him, in spite of my weakness, in spite of my failure, in spite of, at times, my doubt and faithlessness. He knows my heart. He knows I've committed it to him. He knows I know I'm weak. He knows I know I don't deserve it. But I thank you, Lord, that you do not treat me the way I deserve to be treated. You treat me the way I need to be treated, with mercy and grace and patience and forgiveness and love. Right? God 
is asking you today to trust in him. Put your trust and faith in him in spite of your weakness, in spite of your failures, in spite of his silence. Put your trust and faith in him. Notice what Jesus said. I love this verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, not will have, not might have, not depending on the weather, not depending on how I feel. No. He has everlasting life. Shall not, you will not come into condemnation. If you're still fearing condemnation in the judgment, you have not understood the love of God. That's what John says in his first letter. And in his gospel, he quotes the words of Jesus and he tells you, if you hear his word, believe on him that sent him, you will not have condemnation. You have already, already passed from death to life. Now look, the, the, the words, he that hears my word, entails obedience. By no means I'm taking obedience out. But I like the fact that Jesus said, he that hears my word. Meaning, he didn't put a, a specific manifestation on the amount of obedience. We are to go and sin no more, don't get me wrong. But God knows our weakness. He, goes that, he knows that we fail. He knows that it takes us time to get it. We're thick. He knows that it takes the time to get there. So he says, look, man, if you just hear my word and you believe on him that sent me, if you have a desire in your heart to connect to me, to stay in touch with me, to stay connected with me, if you have a desire in your heart to do those things that please me, it doesn't matter how much comes out of that, but if that desire is in your heart, trust me, man, you're in good hands. I will get you there. Right? As a matter of fact, I didn't say that. He says that. Notice what he says. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Notice the next words. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hands. Okay, stop for a second. Who's holding on to who in here? Am I holding on to Jesus, or he's holding on to me? No one. He promised no one will pluck you out of my hands. But he says, but hang on a second. If you don't think I'm strong enough, don't worry about it. Just keep reading. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hands. Look, man, if this is not enough to give you an assurance and confidence, if the hands of the Father, the promise of the Almighty God the Father, telling you, look, man, I'm grabbing with my hand and I will not let anyone take you away. If that promise is not good enough to give you confidence and assurance, back up and go home, man. No use. No use saying anything else. How could we doubt? How could we fear after such beautiful promises? How? Right? So why? Why do we fear? Why don't we have inner peace? I've been thinking about it, and I could come up, <coughs> came up with three reasons. I'm sure there's more. One, lack of understanding of the truth about justification by faith. Somehow, the Catholic understanding of righteousness by faith found its way into all Christianity. Somehow, we've been believing and preaching Catholic doctrine, Catholic understanding of righteousness by faith. That's what I explored last night. And because of that, we have not understood justification by faith. We still mingled our works of faith in it. We still mingled our merit, our works, our obedience in it. And because of that, we have not come to the peace of God because we are honest with ourselves. And we know we still fall short. We're examining our works. We're basing our relationship, our acceptance with God, our peace with Him based on our fruit. And we'll never get there. So one, wrong understanding of righteousness by faith. Two, lack of confidence that I, not just you, not us, not the church, but I am a child of God. Put your name there. You know, so long we were sheltered under a denomination, we had comfort because, you know, 
God might not speak to me, but he speaks to the denomination. He speaks to the prophets of the denomination. He speaks to the pioneers of the denomination. He speaks to the theologians of the denomination. So God is still communicating to me through the denomination. But when we find ourselves outside the denomination, so many of us do not have that confidence and knowledge that I am a child of God, that God can speak to me, that I am worthy to hear the voice of God. Not just the prophets of the denomination, not just the pioneers of the denomination, not just the leaders and theologians, but me too. I am an adopted child of God. I am equally worthy to come before his presence. I'm equally worthy to hear his voice as any prophet and any pioneer and anybody else. Stop doubting who you are. Have confidence that you're a son and a daughter of God, that God loves you. He wants to speak to you. Have confidence that you are accepted, you're loved, you're wanted. You are needed in heaven. Right? And the third reason, fear often is caused by an unbalanced way of seeing things. What do I mean by that? As human beings, we often see things (coughs) in an unbalanced way. We meet a person, we see a situation, we see an event, whatever it is, and we only see one side of it. It's pure good. It's so beautiful. She's the most amazing woman. There's no faults in her. I want her. And because of an unbalanced view of only seeing the good, we end up having fear of losing her, fear of losing that situation, fear of losing that event, whatever it is. Because we only see one side. Or if you only see the bad in a person, the bad in a situation, we end up having fear of obtaining that because we only see one side of it. And this is the way we think, like it or not. That's how we all think, naturally. And when we come to the gospel and we God and, and, and to God, we only see one aspect. And we think God likes us. You see, when you only see one aspect, when you have an unbalanced view, that's when you like someone. You like someone today because it's pure good. I don't like you tomorrow because you showed me another side. Right? That's how we operate. But I praise God that he said, for God so liked the world. No, God so loved the world. You see, when you see both sides... The good about the girl and the bad about the girl. And when you accept both sides, that is pure love. I know the good things about my wife. I know the bad things about my my wife, but I accept her anyway. She knows the bad things about me, and she's still looking for the good things in me, but she accepts me anyway. (laughs) Right? That is pure love when you accept both sides. And what I'm telling you is God doesn't like you. God loves you. That means God knows your bad side as much as your good side. So when your bad side is manifested, don't be scared. You didn't take God by surprise. He already knew it. And he accepted you nonetheless because he loves you. That is what love means. That is the difference between love and like. Love takes both sides into consideration and accepts a person as a whole. God loves me in spite of me. Hallelujah. And because I am justified by faith, in spite of the lack of evidence of that faith, I have peace with God. So you want inner peace? Start here. Start there. Start understanding the foundation of that peace with God. Start understanding righteousness by faith. Start understanding and believing that you are accepted, you're loved, you're wanted, you're needed in heaven in spite of your weakness, in spite of your failures, in spite of the difficulties you face, in spite of all the problems that life throws your way, you are accepted, you are a loved child of God because he's merciful. Not because of who I am, but because of what he did. Not because of what I did, but because of who he is. Amen? Amen. I hope this resonates with you and gives you something to think about. Let's close with a prayer. (coughs) Father, Lord, as unworthy as we are, yet we come before you, knowing, Lord, 
that we are accepted, that we have been made worthy because of what your son Jesus has done. Father, the good news of our salvation, the good news of the gospel, what you have given us in, in your son, Lord, is, is unbelievable. Words cannot express our gratitude and our thanks. Father, I just ask for myself, for my family, for my brothers and sisters in here, for your children, Lord, please give us the faith we need to accept what your word says. Give us the courage we need to accept how outrageous your love and grace is. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for saving us in spite of us. And I pray, Lord, that <clears throat> this love of yours, as we understand it, that it will lead us to become the people you want us to be. So our life will give glory to your name. So your love will shine through us so the world can see that your love has a way of transforming people that nothing else does. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.